with that, uh, I'll turn it over to our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Robert Martin is an anthropologist here at the Field Museum, and he was kind enough to, to stay late tonight and give us a really great introduction to human evolution. So, Dr. Martin. Structure. 
And the same is true of the DNA. Uh, the difference between our, our DNA and that of a chimpanzee is 2%. So 98% of the DNA is the same. And that's a small difference. You have to put that into perspective because um, uh, all living things share a common ancestor, so we share DNA similarity with all living things. In fact, there's a 40% similarity between me and a banana. And uh, the 2% is about what you would expect for a primate that diverged from us about seven or eight million years ago. But just to emphasize the similarity between us and great apes, if you look at this picture, it may seem to be somewhat familiar to you. And the reason is that it was a, <laughs> put together by my students when I was teaching in Switzerland. And in fact, uh, rather than taking that old gorilla, uh, a young gorilla was taken, and they just fused the two images. And the reason the young gorilla was taken was because we have we share more characters with young great apes than with the adults as part of the evolutionary process that led to humans. But it really brings home to you uh, just how similar we are anatomically. And that is my hand alongside a gorilla hand. And that there are a lot of primate characters in there, like having a grasping thumb and flat nails on the fingers and special uh, sense organs for tactile perception. Uh, so you can see this throughout the anatomy. Uh, we are very, very similar to great age. And this leads on to another problem in the way we understand and talk about uh, evolution. If you uh, look at the uh, picture on the left of a tree that is um, Can you get rid of that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you look at the green branch there, this is the basic process in, in the tree of life. It's what we call speciation. You start up at the bottom with a single species. It's a population of interbreeding individuals. And then at some point, something separates that population into two subpopulations. And uh, through the process of natural selection, which is the key to Darwin's origin of species, those two subpopulations go off in their own directions and become adapted to local conditions. And eventually, at the top, you've got two new species. You've got two separate populations, which can no longer interbreed. Now the important thing is that uh, this is a continuous process. If you look at the top, which is today, what you see is two separate species. But the further you go back in time, the closer they become together. And if we imagine that the two species at the top there are the chimp on the left and us on the right, and then you go back in time, you have a common ancestor which was neither a chimp or a human, it was something that was ancestral to both. But that common ancestor was more like a great ape than it was like us. We uh, accumulated a lot of new characters. Evolution on the right branch has gone much faster. But the point is there's an unbroken series of ancestors and descendants. And so where do you define the origin of humans? At what point on that right branch? Do you become human? At what point do you stop being an ape? And this is a, a tricky problem, particularly in understanding what evolution really means for human biology. Uh, everything is continuous. There is no point at which you can just draw a line across and say, well, up to this point it was uh, an ape, but after this level it's human. Because inevitably, the parents of the first human are apes. Something has to lie below the line. And so, as a biologist, we have to think about continuous change. And this leads on to a point called mosaic evolution, that 
If you compare us today with chimpanzees, you can produce a whole list of differences between the two species. But if you go back in time, these characters didn't appear as a package of one particular time. They appeared at different times. <coughs> changes in the teeth appeared first. The changes in the way we move around came second. Changes in the brain were somewhat later, and the origin of stone tools goes back maybe two and a half million years, and uh, was definitely later in the sequence. So, uh, at what point uh, do you become human? Some people took a particular brain capacity of 600 cubic centimeters and said, this is the cerebral rubicon when you pass this, you become human. And the problem is that means if you have 599 cc's, you were an ape and you have 601. <laughs> <laughs> and males, because they're bigger, have 10% more brain than females, and so males became given about 2,000 years, 200,000 years before women did. Um, so this really doesn't work. There is no point at which you can say, this is the last ape and this is the first human. <laughs> and so uh, the starting point, as I hinted, is a comparison between ourselves and great apes, and we can make a list of the distinctions. But if we forget about the cultural side, just concentrate on the biology, the three main areas in which we differ anatomically is in the jaws and teeth, it's in the way we move around and it's in the size of the brain, which is about three times bigger in humans than in great apes. Now if we uh, just look at the skulls, to start off with the top right is human, and the top left is gorilla, bottom left is chimpanzee, and the bottom right is the orangutan. And you can see in the three great apes, the jaws are much bigger, and in particular, the canine teeth are sharp, stabbing teeth. They're much better developed than the other teeth. In humans, the canine teeth are essentially just like the incisors at the front. And you can actually feel a bit of evolutionary history if you put your finger just here. The crowns of our canine teeth are being reduced, but the roots are still bigger than the incisors. And you can see the bump here, which is the big root of the canine on either side. So that's a little retention from our common ancestor. And uh, we have very small teeth, and this is something that has occurred within the hominid uh, lineage. So after we branched away from chimpanzees, our teeth got smaller and smaller. And if we look at this slide here on the left, you see a chimpanzee upper jaw with the big canine teeth, and on the far right is human. And you can see the canines are small and, and not at all different from the incisors. We also have a more gently rounded dental arcade, not U-shaped, as is in the gray days. And in between those, you have an early hominid, Australopithecus afarensis, showing that it's intermediate. And this is what you see in the fossil record. Uh, these things happen at different times. They peak at different times, but you see gradual change, in this case, in the dentition. The way we walk around is quite unique in the animal kingdom. It's called striding bipedalism. And we don't use our arms at all when we're moving around. And there are other animals that use just their hind limbs, but they typically hop around rather than striding. And this has been, had enormous influence on our anatomy, literally from the head down to the toes. Uh, if you look at the skull, for example, the underneath the skull there is the foramen magnum, which simply means big hole in Latin, and that's where the spinal cord comes out of the So and in the human skull, it's underneath the skull because we walk upright, the head is balanced on the spine, and the foramen magnum is, is brought in forwards underneath the skull. Whereas in a great ape, it's angled completely backwards, and then you need big muscles to hold the head in position, so there's a big attachment area for muscles, which we just reduce. 
used to a tiny little area just behind the spinal cord. And you can see all kinds of changes all the way down. I won't go into all of them, but one of them which is quite important is the uh, change of the thigh bone. If you look on the uh, far right, you can see the human thigh bone. Now, first of all, our legs have become longer than our arms. Apes have long arms, short legs. We have short arms and long legs. And our knees have been moved in towards the midline. And the reason for that is quite simple. When you're walking, uh, you're standing a lot of the time on one leg whilst you're swinging the other leg forward. And the center of gravity of your body has to go down through the knee, otherwise you can tip over. And to achieve that, you've got this so-called carrying angle, the thigh bone is angled in towards the midline so that your knee is underneath the center of gravity. That one character can tell you in the fossil record whether you've got an upright walker or not, just as the position of the frame and magnum underneath the skull can tell you. And if you go right down to the foot, one of the big changes is that we can no longer grasp with our feet. I mentioned the grasping hand initially, but if you look at non-human primates, it's actually the grasping foot that is best developed, and the grasping hand is more variable. But all primates except us have a beautiful grasping foot. We have lost that grasping capacity, and our big toe has been brought into line with the others. And the reason for that is when you're walking, the last point you push off with when your foot leaves the ground is the tip of your big toe. So it has to be aligned with the other toes, and it has to be found to them. There's a special new ligament to do that. So there are huge changes in the skeleton for striding by people. And in fact, the earliest evidence we have for striding by people is not a thigh bone or anything else. It's an actual footprint trail that was discovered in uh, East Africa in Tanzania. That's Mary Leakey uh, kneeling down uh, uncovering that. And it's actually um, three individuals. The trail on the left seems fairly fuzzy, and the reason for that is that there were actually two individuals. One individual walked along, and the second individual walked afterwards, putting its feet in more or less in the same position. I found it even more human than the striding bipedalism, which is evident from those footprints. Uh, what happened was that there was a volcanic eruption, ash settled on the ground, it rained, and then it set like concrete, and you have a footprint trail, which is 3.6 million years old. It's older than the oldest skeleton we have, which is Lucy. And on the right, you can see a human foot. You can see the typical way the weight is transferred as you walk, you strike with the heel on the ground. Your weight goes along the outside of your foot, swings in towards the midline, and then as I've said, the tip of your big toe is the push-off point. And that leaves a very characteristic footprint, and you can see uh, the enlargement of that footprint from the footprint trail is very similar. However, if you look carefully at the big toe, there is a hint there that that big toe was still somewhat spread in the Australopithecus. Uh, the third anatomical area in which we differ is brain size. And you can sometimes uh, look at this from a skull. If you take a cast of the inside of the brain case of the skull, you can get a pretty good impression of what the brain was like in size. And, uh, and I obviously pushed something. Um, and I didn't shake um, You can actually get natural what happens is that the brain rots away and the skull gets filled with matrix which then fossilizes and then maybe the skull bones are, are lost and you get a natural endocast as it's called. If you look at the one on the top right, you can see there's a bit of the face, you can see the two eye sockets. The, but the root of the skull has gone leaving a beautiful natural cast of the brain. 
And from evidence like that, we can reconstruct on the right. In fact, the brain size over at least the past four million years has got bigger and bigger, starting with the Australopithecus at the top, and then the Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and then at the bottom, Homo sapiens. And you can actually see in the fossil record how the brain increases by about a factor of three uh, over this time. Now the brain is interesting. I'm not going to say too much about cultural aspects, but uh, the uh, language is particularly interesting because it's a mixture of biological changes and cultural changes. Which language you learn depends on uh, the society in which you grow up. But the, all humans have the capacity for language, for spoken language. And there are uh, several adaptations to this. One of them is in the brain, if you look at the top right. We have developed two particular areas of the brain, Broca's area and Bernica's area, which are important for producing and understanding language. But the other thing uh, which is unique to us among mammals is that at birth, our larynx here, the voice box, looks just like that of the gray like the chimpanzee on the left there. But uh, within the first two years after birth, the larynx descends, it, it sinks, creating the large chamber that we need for articulated speech. And so this is something that isn't present at birth, it, it uh, develops during the first two years of life. And at the end of that period, we're unique, and that is essential for the kind of spoken language that we have. So here we have biological changes that must have occurred during human evolution that are necessary for behavior, but the kind of language we speak depends on the society. Okay, so that was the introductory part about some basic ideas in human evolution, and really to get across the point of gradual change of different characters changing at different times and at different speeds. And at no point can you say, here we stop being made and here we stop being human. It's a gradual sequence, biologically speaking. Okay, so this is uh, a, a tree. You need to worry about the details. The main point of showing this particular diagram is that a lot of people now recognize up to 22 hominid species, that means members of the lineage since it diverged from chimpanzees. And the yellow are our various species of Homo, and the orange uh, in the middle, there are Australopithecus, there are also some blue species. The top right is a chimpanzee, and there is a robust form of Australopithecus called Paranthropus, which is in Greek. So this shows you um, how complicated things have become. In Darwin's time, only one fossil hominid was known, the Neanderthal type specimen from Germany. And so it was very easy to regard that as a direct ancestor of humans. But now it looks far more like a bush than a tree. And that wall of skulls that I showed you at the beginning that's in the Darwin exhibit really makes a point that uh, there are something like 22 different species on that tree. Now, um, sorry, I should point out right at the beginning, you can see most of those species started around 4 million years ago. The middle, about halfway up the diagram, is 4 million years ago. Down at the bottom right, there are two things that may be early hominids. And one of them is called Sahelanthropus from Chad, and the other is Ororin from Kenya. And Sahelanthropus is between six and seven million years old. And that tells us that if it is a hominid, then we must have split from chimpanzees by at least seven million years ago. And this is the skull of Sahelanthropus. And it's not been studied uh, tremendously so far. They found more chip material recently. But there are two key features about it. One is the canine teeth are small. But the thing I find most convincing is the foramen magnum is moved forward underneath the skull. And the 
area for attachment of the neck muscles is reduced. So it seems fairly clear from that skull that this individual looked upright, and walked upright, and was moving towards the human condition. The form RRM from Kenya is really quite controversial. Um, they haven't found very much, and the main evidence is this femur or thigh bone. Uh, we don't have the bottom end, which is really the interesting part. The bottom end tells you whether you've got a carrying angle or not. You can't really tell from the top of the femur or thigh bone. And so other characters have been used, and so this one has a big question mark connected with it. But I think Sahalanthus, that skull, uh, is fairly convincing evidence that we had diverged by from chimpanzees by at the latest seven million years ago. But you have to wait uh, something like three, three and a half million years before you get really good evidence, starting about four million years ago. And the first representative is Australopithecus. And on the left is a child skull, which was actually the first uh, fossil evidence. And the one on the right is um, an adult. Um, these are from South Africa, and they're called Australopithecus africanus. And after a while, it was discovered there was a, a much more heavily built hominid living in, in South Africa, and that was called Paranthropus robustus. And so you can see a skull of that at the top left, and at the bottom you can see a comparison between a robust Paranthropus and a gracile Australopithecus. So that, these are representatives from South Africa. The dating is difficult, and the reason for that is that uh, all of the hominid fossils are found from cave sites. And in order to give a date to anything, you, you hardly ever date the specimen itself. What you do is date layers above and below the fossil. And you need volcanic material for that, usually. You need something that has uh, elements with radioactive decay. And you don't have that in these cave in hills. The caves fill up with debris, including veins of these hominids, and eventually they wear down and if the deposits are exposed. So there's no easy way of telling the age. We think that Australopithecus africanus is around three million years old and the Paranthropus is more like one to two. Now recently an ex-student of mine, uh, uh, Ron Cook, well, this goes back almost a decade now, I guess, when we first found it. He uh, was looking through the finds from one of those caves and found foot bones uh, on the right, which are uh, hominid foot bones. But you can see that the big toe was still somewhat spread apart. And so we ha actually have foot evidence in Australopithecus africanus. And it, it's, as I would expect, it's intermediate between a grasping foot of a chimpanzee and our non-grasping foot. And uh, Ron called that little foot, but he then said, you know, you hardly ever get foot bangs. If you look in the evolving planet exhibit, if you look at the Lisi skeleton, there are no foot bangs, there are no hand bangs, or very few. And if you look at the Homo erectus skeleton from East Africa, uh, it's the same thing. There are uh, very few of the hand and foot bangs survive. They usually get carried away to small bones. But Ron said, you know, if the foot bands are here, then the whole skeleton must be there somewhere. And so he kept going through the fossil site until he found the ends of the legs sticking out of the matrix. So so many years ago, he collected the foot bands, not realizing there was an entire skeleton uh, right next door. And for the past decades, um, Ron has been painstakingly using dental drills to remove that skeleton from the matrix, so I hope it will be published sometime soon. Uh, Lucy, uh, you've heard of us, uh, actually from a somewhat different species and somewhat earlier, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, slightly more primitive, first found in Ethiopia and Tanzania, and quite a lot of material, as you can see, 
people know what these tools at the top right is that uh, upper tool that I showed you earlier in the drawing. And this is the famous Lucy skeleton, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. It's about 40% uh, clean. And one of the key things you can see about Lucy is that she is very small. And the other thing is that that skeleton is a real mixture of eight and given characteristics. If you look at the rib cage, it's like a, an inverted funnel, like a chimpanzee. The arms are slightly longer than the legs, so it's eight like. But if you look at the pelvis, it's squat and broadened from side to side, and there's a beautiful carrying angle on the thigh bones that are angled in towards the knees quite clearly. And so, in some respects, Lucy looks like an ape, and in some respects, looks like us, which is precisely what you would expect of something that is halfway between the common ancestor of chimps and humans and modern humans. And that's the reconstruction of Lucy uh, in the uh, exhibit. Uh, people sometimes ask me how we know that Lucy is a female. Uh, uh, my answer to that is, but in fact we don't know. The reason some people think Lucy is a female is because she's small, and they think they have bits and pieces of big males. But people like me think that the bits and pieces from the bigger individuals are actually a different species. And when I was in Switzerland, uh, we had one of our colleagues work on this skeleton, he came to the conclusion it's actually a male. And so in Syria, this specimen is not known as Lucy, but it's called Lucifer. <laughs> 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 and more recently in uh, East Africa, an even older Australopithecus in Kenya has been found, Australopithecus anamensis. Here really bits and pieces, but it's an interesting example of mosaic evolution in some ways. Australopithecus animensis is closer to us than the latest species. And it's again an example of mosaic evolution. These things don't happen in a nice linear sequence. It's like experiments going on in different places where the jaw is still pretty primitive. The other thing is animensis seems to be a bigger species of a bigger bill than either Lucy or the South African form. And this skull was quite important. It's a Paranthropus that was discovered from East Africa. For a long period of time, people thought that Australopithecus was before Paranthropus. And so we had a nice evolutionary sequence of that Australopithecus led to Paranthropus, the big, heavily built form on one hand and over on the other. But it turned out when they found this skull, it's 2.5 million years old, and it actually overlaps with Australopithecus. So it's clear that uh, this coexisted with later Australopithecus because it wasn't a direct successor. And so just one fossil find like this can change our ideas about the tree. And that brings me on to the genus Homo. So you've got that Australopith sign lab with Australopithecus, the grass arm forms, and you've got Paranthropus, the reverse form. And <coughs> we then come to Homo. Some people distinguish between Homo gaster and Homo erectus, so that East African skeleton is dated about 1.6 million years old. Some people call Homo gaster. Uh, I, I personally don't think it's that different from Homo erectus. Um, the first uh, species of Homo is Homo habilis, goes back to around 2 million years. Um, pretty fragmentary, but um, we do know that the brain size was increased. And there is a small foot. Uh, her habilis, like Lucy, was quite a small species. And that foot, again, shows some evidence that the big toe wasn't quite aligned with the other toes, so it's still somewhat intermediate, but in other respects, it's a human-like foot. And this skull was quite important. One thing that uh, I usually use as a distinguishing feature of Homo is for some reason the nasal bones stick out in Homo. 
and just flatten and fit into the place and australopithecus of Bradford. As soon as you get to Homer, you get these projecting nasal bands, which is the only means that you can have a proper human nose as opposed to the great egg kind of nose. And this is that East African skeleton known as Tolkana boy, uh, because it's from a young individual, about 14 years old. And the skull is quite well preserved, and we know that the brain size now is 900 cc's, twice as big as in uh, Australopithecus and Fiji. And on the left, if you look at that skirt in Lisi, the Lisi skirt is about 3.2 million years old, so this skirt is half as old, it's 1.6. And you see how much more human life is. The arms are definitely shorter than the legs. The rib cage is now barrel shaped, it's not shaped like the funnel as in the great age. And you've got the beautiful carrying angle on the um, thigh bands on either side angling in towards the midline. We have pretty much all of that skeleton except for the fact we have no angle or foot bands and we just have a few finger bands. Uh, everything else from the hands and feet disappear. One uh, fossil you may not have heard of, which is becoming quite important, is Manisi in uh, Georgia. It used to be part of the USSR. Um, until this discovery was made, everybody believed that no hominid existed outside Africa until a million years ago. Homo erectus outside of Africa was no older than a million. And then this lower jaw was found in Georgia, and it was said it was 1.6 million years old, and so that threatened this idea that Homo didn't get out of Africa until a million years ago. And so initially people said, well, if you look at the jaw, it's clearly not that primitive, or if you look at the dating, the dating isn't reliable. But we now know that that dating is absolutely reliable. This is 1.6 million years ago, 1.6 to 1.7, so it's at least as old as that skeleton from East Africa. And they've since found five skulls and a lot of the skeletons. And so we're beginning to get a, a good picture of uh, this home. It's probably Homo erectus, but this has also been called Homo gasta by some people. Now at this stage, 2.5 million years ago, and, uh, younger we uh, actually have stone tools. Homo habilis had very primitive stone tools, which are called pebble tools, where you just remove a few flakes and you get a cutting edge. So this is the kind of tool you get with early Homo, and the tools you find with Homo erectus in East Africa and in Georgia are pretty much the same. And then later on you get full-blown Homo erectus, which is primarily known from Asia, from Java, the Trinil and skull, and from China, the uh, skull. And we're getting up to a pretty big brain size now, almost into the modern human range. The teeth are still fairly big, they're smaller than in Australopithecus, but bigger than in us. And a very distinctive skull shape. But um, we also have skulls that look very much like that from East Africa, and one from Holden by Thought, which is probably around half a million years old, looks very much like an East Asian um, Homo erectus. And with Homo erectus, uh, around a half a million years ago, you get the first really recognizable stain tools, where and the classical tool is this pear shaped hand axe. And it's very recognizable because if you look at uh, right at the top of that sequence, uh, number four, the only way to get a cutting edge on one of those hand axes is to remove plates alternately from one side and the other. You then get a uh, sinuous cutting edge, and you can see that edge on in drawing number four. And that same technique has been used over two and a half million years, there are people today who still make hand axes with precisely that same technique. So the, the
technique has actually changed less than the anatomy over that time. And that brings us up to the common ancestry of Neanderthals and ourselves at the top left of that diagram. There's a big argument about this, but I tend to think, uh, for various reasons, it was early. I think that we probably separated from Neanderthals about a million years ago. And at that time, uh, there are so called archaic homo-they sometimes are put in sapiens, but it's really near the root where the two things divided like Steinheim in Germany. But the important thing is with more advanced homo, with the common ancestry of Neanderthals and ourselves, you get another improvement in staying tool technique called the prepared core technique. So instead of taking a piece of flint and making one tool out of it, you take the flint and you prepare it and you strike flakes off it and the flakes of the tools. And so you get these um, very relatively small uh, knife-like flakes that come off of it. It's far more efficient than taking one piece of flint and making hand axe. You can get a lot of little razors um, in this way. And Homo sapiens has much more advanced stone tools than Neanderthals. We use what are called microblades. We use incredibly fine blades, and they only make sense if you're uh, fitting them to spears and arrows. And all of this is about efficiency. If you look at the uh, diagram on the right, uh, starting with pebble tools at the top, you've got a, a very primitive cutting edge by now. You can use one of those pear-shaped uh, pear hand axes, you've got more cutting edge. But if you produce one of these cores on the left here, that is what is left after all of the tools have been struck off of it. And uh, you get much more cutting edge, particularly with Homo sapiens down at the bottom. Now, the question of whether Homo sapiens and Neanderthals are separate species has been going on for quite a while. There were two in, uh, different models. One was the uh, so-called regional continuity, which was the idea that there was only ever one species, and that Neanderthals are just early Europeans. And the other one on the right is the single origin idea, which is that Neanderthals branched off as a separate species, and you've got several different species. And that model is now uh, pretty much the winner the Neanderthals were geographically isolated to Europe and Central Asia and cold adapted. This is the type specimen from the Under Valley, which gave the name Neanderthal. And that is the only hominid that was known when Darwin wrote the origin of species. And so it's, um, we now have far more evidence that was available at that time. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that this was an early hominid that uh, once this was this was a disgruntled German taxpayer who sold up in a cave on the Neander River. The other tiles are much more heavily built than uh, modern humans. If you look at toe, the terminal bones of the big toe at the top there, the thickness of the walls of the log bones and the incisors of the Powerfully developed in the other parts. <coughs> and it was really uh, not until about 30,000 years ago people thought that you've got Homo sapiens and this is beginning with the Cro Magnons. And one of the features that uh, differs between us and, and the other is if you look underneath the jaw bones here, there's a hollow. And that hollow you can see very clearly there's a dark shadow on the right side of the picture. And uh, it's less obvious on the left. The Neanderthals don't have that. This is all solid bang. And it was eventually discovered in the Middle East that 100,000 years ago you could find either Homo sapiens on the left, you see that hollow here, or Neanderthals. So, 100,000 years ago, both were around, but we've never found them together. And in the uh, Evolving Planet exhibit, uh, there is a dis 
display of uh, reconstructed Neanderthal skirts alongside a modern human skirt. And when you see them side by side, you can see so many differences. They really are very different. And so it's absolutely clear anatomically that we're dealing with two separate species. And this shows uh, that display there with the Neanderthal and the um, modern human skirt. While I'm on the topic of um, evolving fat, I would like to uh, emphasize the important role that Richard played in that exhibit. That exhibit is a huge uh, success in my view. It really gets the story of evolution across. And the reason it worked is because of the chemistry between the curators, who can sometimes be an ordinary bunch, and the <laughs> exhibit people who have their own ideas. Um, Sometimes that doesn't quite work, but in this case it worked beautifully, and a lot of the credit for that belongs to Richard, so he helped to make that uh, a successful exhibit. I, I worked on the Amatol uh, cells myself in Switzerland. We did CAT scans of a four year old Neanderthal child on the left. And even at the age of four years, if you compare it to the modern human child at the same age, you can tell the difference, and in fact, my colleagues later show that you can tell the difference of birth. Now, if you can tell the difference between two species of birth, they're clearly very, very different. This is Elizabeth Dynas, who produced the uh, reconstruction. Lucy lives on display in the Golden Cup, and the, there she is doing the reconstruction of that Neanderthal child for us. And the real cruncher came with uh, Neanderthal DNA. I, people didn't think this was going to be possible, but eventually they managed to extract DNA from that type specimen for the Neanderthal. And you have to look at mitochondrial DNA for various technical reasons, a separate little molecule. And on the top left is the tree that came out of this. Uh, and the Neanderthal, you can see, was quite different from all of the humans they looked at and branched off somewhere after the branch between chimps and humans. And if you look at the uh, bottom uh, example, these are pair comparisons. So taking any modern human and comparing it with any other modern human, the orange shows you the distribution of distances in DNA terms. And the green shows the difference between that Neanderthal and any modern human segment brand. And you can see those distances are much bigger, but they're obviously not as big as the blue, which is the distance between any chimpanzee and any human. Now, everybody said, oh, uh, it's only one Neanderthal. Uh, but they then went on, uh, we now have eight. Neanderthals, they're all the same, they all cluster together and separately from us. And Svante Faber of <coughs> Leipzig has been spearheading this effort and is currently engaged on sequencing the entire nuclear genome. So they're doing a genome project on the Neanderthal. And so they're hoping within the next two years to come up with the entire DNA sequence of uh, Neanderthal. There with us, but their preliminary results, having done less than one tenth of that, show quite clearly that Neanderthals were separate species. And so, if you went back a hundred thousand years ago, there were not just one species, but two species around with uh, Neanderthals, and there were modern humans. And uh, that raises a lot of questions too. Because at the time when humans and Neanderthals diverged from humans and Neanderthals, the brain size was only about two thirds of what it is today. So in those two separate lineages, brain size increased over time. And so, and Neanderthals actually, when they died out, they actually had bigger brains than we do. And they achieved that independently. And so if we imagine that having such a big brain somehow defines being human, then Neanderthals were more human than we are. Uh, on which point I'll 
Does anybody have uh, any questions for Dr. Martin? Africa. I mean, can I explain to my 12-year-old kids that basically we are all African in origin? Is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, what are the conditions that's, like that's this? That's the demographic project. Okay. That's why it's my strong real DNA. Okay. Starting in Africa. You might like to pass this around. There's a very nice project. This is National Geographic. Mm -hmm. and getting DNA people so you can get a little badge showing you where your DNA came from. Um, and it's just chance. I mean that's where I think the real reason if you look at it is the our Texas relative to Kimberly and the are Africans. And uh, so it makes an awful lot of sense. And Darwin, although he had one cross that said this must have happened in Africa, so Darwin predicted this. And um, eventually that's where the earliest fossils were found and it's still true. Uh, the earliest fossil is around six to seven million years ago, and then you have to go up to around two million. And we got out of Africa earlier than people thought, but it's still only around two million years ago. For the period seven to two million years ago, it was all an African story, as far as we know. I always kept about this because that's where everybody's been looking. We're so convinced that the period in Africa, nobody's really seriously looking in Asia. And so I think we could have some surprises if people took the effort they 